oh boy, the things they carry. Today, I want to teach a short story. It's actually a novel, but it's this part of it is the short story. It's the first chapter of the novel, The Things They Carry. I, I was thinking about this as I was preparing today. Um, the Things They Carried is a novel, so it would be italicized. But in this case, you are quote you are uh, if you're going to use this in a paper, you are citing the short story version. So you put it in uh, in a quotation marks. The novel would be italicized. This will be quotation marks. Okay, so just cite it exactly as you would out of our Fiction 100 book as a short story. This is the first chapter of the book, the things they carried, and. Uh, it is a great novel, published in 1990 by Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien is actually a professor at Texas State, and that's where I got my master's degree, Texas State. And I, he's in the creative writing program, which I, they have, in fact, uh, Texas State has a really super good MFA program, Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing. Um, which is a terminal degree, kind of like a PhD. But anyway, um, he teaches in that program. Ouch, I'm kind of in pain here. Hang on. Okay, he teaches in that program. So I, I, would, I saw him a few times, but I never had a class with him. Um, in, in any event, this is his Vietnam War story. He is a veteran, Vietnam War veteran. And the I we've been doing this long enough now for you to know that this has a central motif, and the motif is just found right in the title. It is the things that they carry. And I added a word there. The things they carry is what it is. Okay, I'm gonna get. <laughs> Sorry, I've got oh, a little bit of awk awkward day. The central motif is the things they carried. And of course, that is a kind of a double entendre. It is symbolic because we all carry things, right? We carry things. Here's my pen. I usually carry that. How much does it weigh? A few ounces, right? But we carry things. We, also, we carry things. But we also carry guilt. We carry uh, trauma. We carry... So where is everybody going? We carry trauma. We carry um, the stain of war. We carry all kinds of stuff with us. We carry hate and bitterness. And we carry fears. So we carry all these emotional states as well as things. I usually carry my headphones on my key ring and the proverbial, we carry a lot, don't we? And most all of us carry, see, I try to carry as little as possible. So I have my ID and my credit card back here. See that? Eh, eh, don't need a wallet. I'm kind of a minimalist, right? But anyway, and I was always a minimalist and I'll tell you that in a minute, but, but check it out. That is the, the triumph of this thing. It's the central motif. He, he tells the story through the lens of the actual items that they carry. I'm <laughs> just picking up all kinds of crap I have on my desk. Oh, always need this. Whoa, sorry. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to read from the novel or the, the short story. And as, as we go through it, speak about some of these things and about the themes that come up with it. Um, like I said, it was published in 1990. Let's see, this thing won a bunch of awards. Let me see which ones they are. Uh, let's see, 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 see. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize <laughs> and the uh, National Book Critics Circle Award. So it won the Chicago Tribune Heart Heartland Prize. Um, 
sold 2 million copies worldwide. Once um, this, um, it's a French award, <laughs> Prix du Millier, kind of awards. <laughs> and uh, like I said, it's on Amazon's list of best 100 books of all time. Um, it is credited as an inspiration for the Na National Veterans Art Museum. So, I mean, it's no joke. And I, I think it's a great, I think it's a great short story and novel. Lots of great themes. Let's begin, let's begin. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha, a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New York, in New Jersey. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping. So he kept them folded in plastic at the bottom of his rucksack. In the late afternoon, after a day's march, he would dig his foxhole, wash his hands under a canteen, unwrap the letters, hold them with the tips of his fingers, and spend the last hour of light pretending. He would imagine romantic camping trips into the white mountains of New Hampshire. He would sometimes, he would sometimes taste the envelopes, knowing her tongue had been there. More than anything, he wanted Martha to love him as he loved her, but the letters were mostly chatty, elusive on the matter of love. She was a virgin. He was almost sure. She was an English major at Mount Sebastian. She wrote beautifully about her professors and roommates and midterm exam midterm exams, about her respect for Chaucer and her great affection for G Virginia Woolf. She often quoted lines of poetry. She never mentioned the war, except to say, Jimmy, take care of yourself. These letters weighed 10 ounces. They were signed. They were signed Mar Love Martha, but Lieutenant Cross understood that love was only a way of signing and did not mean what he sometimes pretended it meant. At dusk, he would carefully return the letters to his rucksack slowly. A bit distracted, he would get up and move among his men, checking the perimeter. Then at full dark, he would return to his home and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. Now that whole virgin part I find distasteful, but, but I want you to know that this part right here, he opens, Tim O'Brien opens his novel with these letters. And I want to tell you that when you are, when you are on deployment, when you are in basic training, when you're at, at, at training in your tech school, you are severely, severely, severely restricted from everything that the normal world would have. And so any little signal, any little signal from home is worth its weight in gold, so to speak. Yeah, letters. Letters are the most powerful thing that you can have. They're like a beacon. They're like a beacon of the old times, of what you once were, of who you once were. And they're this communication of, of tenderness and love that you can't imagine until you've been taken away from it. I always tell people, I say, you want to you want a cure for depression? <laughs> you want a cure for sadness? Go on deployment, man. Go spend a year in, in Iraq. When you come back, you will be astonished how everything is new, how everything is pristine and good. These letters weighed 10 ounces. Here begins that central motif, that, that recurring symbol throughout the whole short story and novel, they weighed 10 ounces, but how much did they weigh on his mind, on his soul, on his heart, right? Letters, oh my God. But not just letters, not just letters. They were the letters of unrequited love. I noticed this when I was in Kuwait. Um, people will 
people will write you letters and they'll do it out of a self-serving kind of need. They'll write them because that's what they're supposed to do. You're supposed to write a service member letters and, you know, right? Because they, they're really, now, if she says, love Martha, he's hoping. He's hoping. It even says he's hoping. But she is signing these letters, love Martha, as a way to say, in the platonic sense, I think. And maybe she holds out some hope for some romantic attachment later on, but I get the impression that she is writing them because she feels like it's her duty. It's her duty to do that. But this is what poor Jimmy Cross has to hang on to. Now, let's think about Jimmy. Let's think about the cross. <sighs> Name symbolism, right? First of all, cross. Gosh, it goes so many ways. I, I think most of you know this, but... In the military, you have ranks, right? And you, they're divided into two different types of service members. The first is the officers. The definition of an officer is someone who can issue orders without higher authority. Traditionally, you always have to have a college degree to be an officer in the military. You can't do it without a college degree. And you have to be under 30 pretty much when you start, you know, to, when you become commissioned. And then there's all the rest, and they are the enlisted folks, and they are people right out of high school. Now, I want to tell you something, and I want to, you know, I want to make a deep imprintation of this, deep imprint of this in your mind. War, when you watch Platoon, when you watch um, Full Metal Jacket, when you watch Apocalypse Now, it shows men at war and full-grown women at war, full-grown men. They're like 35, 40, you know, they're, they're, look about, they're about like my age, playing a 25-year-old, something like that. You guys, this is not the case. The people who go to war are 18. They're, they're 18, just out of high school. And they are being led by 23-year-old officers. Now, I don't, I don't want to sound disparaging because I would, give, I, I would give my right pinky to go back and be 23 again. But when you are 23, you, you don't have it all figured out yet, I promise. I don't think I have it all figured out now. <laughs> but 23 is awfully young, awfully young. And here he is leading this platoon of men. Of course, in Vietnam, there were no frontline women soldiers. There were many, many women in the military, but not frontline soldiers. There are now, I believe. But anyway, these letters weigh on Jimmy more than any physical weight ever could, right? The things they carry. This is one thing he carried. And he was their officer. He was their first lieutenant, which means he passed the, he's actually kind of Oh, if it was Air Force, he'd be just before captain, which is pretty, pretty decent, but he's still a lieutenant. We call them butter bars, and they are young officers, right? And they're in charge without question. They tell you to go into that foxhole. They tell you to go into that tunnel. You got to do it. You can't say no. You must, unless it's an unlawful order. You must. You must. And then with the unlawful part, there's a lot of interpretation that comes into that. So you are putting your life in this guy's hands and he's 23 years old and lovesick. And he's got these letters that he, the things they carried were largely determined by necessity. Among the necessities or near necessities were P38 can openers, pocket knives. Sorry, spider. Among the necessities or near necessities were P38 can openers, pocket knives, heat tabs, wristwatches, dog tags, mosquito repellent, chewing gum, candy, cigarettes, salt tablets, packets of Kool-Aid, lighters, matches, sewing kits, military payment certificates, sea rations, and two or three canteens of water. Together, these items weighed 15 and 20 pounds, depending upon the man's habits and rate of metabolism. 
Henry Dobbins, who was a big man, carried out extra rations. He was especially fond of canned peaches in heavy syrup over pound cake. Dave Jensen, who practiced field hygiene, <laughs> just think about that, carried a toothbrush, dental floss, and several hotel-sized bars of soap he'd stolen on R&R &R in Sydney, Australia. Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tan Ni in mid-April. Okay, so it really did depend on, now let me tell you what I did in the Air Force. I was a forward air controller, which means I was attached to an F-15 squadron and we would go, we were, it was very strange in the Air Force, very strange. I was a, um, a ground combat soldier in the Air Force and uh, we would go, we would, go ahead of the F-15s and we would control, we, we, we had a radar, so we would control their, their uh, movement. And so, and so, uh, yes. And so I did all this kind of, all this is very familiar to me, very familiar. We had, I had all kinds of training and all, all this kind of stuff. And we, I was in Colombia and Kuwait. Um, and I'll probably tell you a few things about that here in a minute. But let me tell you, let me show you what I mean by children go to war. Hang on. Yeah, <laughs> look at that dude. Yep, sure enough. Sure enough. Yeah, see if I can make this a little bigger. This is when I was in Colombia right here. I look at myself and I think, gosh, I don't know if I can make it bigger, you guys. Probably see it. This is a day when I cr crawled into an, a blown up Iraqi tank and stole the gauge. I have it on my wall back there. You can probably see it right there. <laughs> this is Captain Khalif in, in uh, Kuwait. He was uh, attacked. He was uh, taken POW by Saddam Hussein and tortured for about three months in the middle, in the middle there. There's all my crew that went to Kuwait with me. There's me in Kuwait. Me in Kuwait, I had I was selling a Cuban cigars, very <laughs> to the commander. And then there's me eating uh, MREs. We all have our favorite MREs. There's me in Kuwait. I was a radio technician for a forward air control squadron, and I worked on those kind of things there. Yep, seen what I mean about children go to war. <laughs> yep. It's true. This is kind of the view from what we would do. Yep, there I am, guarding some gate somewhere. Yep. <laughs> I had the presence of mind. We were attacked in Colombia by the FARC with mortar fire and all that. I had the presence of mind to take a picture. This is Fernando. He's, he's a uh, co uh, Colombian Air Force guy, actually. There's where I lived, some of the Colombians. Yep, yep, sure enough. Yep. Yep, M60. Let's see if I can play this for you. Let's see if it works. This is the M203 grenade launcher. That's me. I doubt you can hear it, but it's okay. That was actually a really super good shot.
Okay, so you get my point. Children, children go to war. Yep. This is a. Uh, it's in Colombia, Colombian special forces guys. You can tell which one's me. <gasps> okay, I could show you more, but you get it. Oh yeah. Yep. Children go to war. Ted Lavender was scared. Ted Lavender was scared. And I want to tell you about that. He's going to talk about it at length in a minute, but it, but it really, the whole thing works on the fear of embarrassment, really. The fear of being humiliated in, in basic training, which is pretty hilarious, honestly. Um, and then the fear of uh, letting your buddies down later on. So the things you carry are things directly related to your job, but also dr directly related to the fear that you fear inside that you don't want anybody to know that you're feeling, right? All these things weighed between 15 and 20 pounds out of the necessity, the, ne the necessary things, right? Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tanmi in mid-April. By necessity, and because it was standard operating procedure, they all carried steel helmets that weighed five pounds, including the liner, camouflage, and camouflage cover. They carried the standard fati uh, fatigue jackets and trousers. We call those BDUs, battle dress uniform. Very few carried underwear. It is what it is. They carried the standard, you know, I had this one guy. I was, I was in Kuwait with this one guy. He says, Sean Felt, what's up? You know, it's crazy enough to think that we've been here in Colombia doing this for whatever. But it's even crazier to think I haven't been wearing air underwear most of the time. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> okay. So on their feet, they carried jungle boots, 2.1 pounds, definitely a necessity. D Dave Jensen carried three pairs of socks and a can of Dr. Scholl's foot powder. Oh, man. Precaution against trench foot. Until he was shot, until he was shot, Dave, Ted Lavender carried six or seven ounces of premium dope, which for him was a necessity. Mitchell Sanders, the RTO, carried condoms. Norman Boker carried a diary. Rat Kylie carried comic books. Kiowa, a devout Baptist, look at the irony there. Kiowa, a devout Baptist, he's the Native American, carried an illustrated New Testament that had been presented to him by his father who taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. There's so much packed into that, you guys, right there. He's a Native American. He lives in Oklahoma, which would be the, the reservation area for, for like the Comanche and several others. Um, and he's a Baptist minister. Oh, man, there's so much packed into that. As a hedge against bad times, however, Kiowa also carried his grandmother's distrust of the white man. His grandfather's old hunting hatchet necessity dictated. Because the land was mined and booby-trapped, it was SOP for each man to carry a steel-centered, nylon-covered flak jacket, which weighed 6.7 pounds. That's a lot. But which, on hot days, seemed much heavier because you could die so quickly. Each man carried at least one large comp compress bandage, usually in the helmet band, for easy access. Because nights were cold and because the monsoons were wet, each carried a green plastic poncho that could be used as a raincoat or ground sheet or makeshift tent. With its quilted liner, the poncho weighed almost two pounds, but it was worth every ounce. Now, let me tell you about this thing. It is affectionately called the whoopee. And 
here is my will be right here. I have slept with this damn thing for 25 years now. No kidding. I got this when I first got to my unit in, in the Air Force, and it was brand new then. This is probably the most successful piece of military hardware ever invented. It's ostensibly a poncho liner. No one that I've ever known has ever used it for a poncho liner, but it is used for every other thing you can imagine. When I was in Colombia, we used them for walls. They're used for stretchers. They're used, like I said, for tents. They're used for anything you can imagine. I'm telling you, these things are the most versatile pieces of hardware. This was brand new when I got it. Notice it has the strings hanging off. You can hang these things up. You can use them for uh, privacy, for shade. You can do so much with them. This is called the Wooby, and it's kind of what used to be slick anyway. It used to be slick. And it's very comfortable. It is everyone I knew, everyone I knew. Now, not all service members get it. You have to be like a ground combat person, but everyone I knew who had the Wooby slept with it on their beds at night. I mean, you know, as a, as a, as a sh blanket, it's perfect. It's the perfect piece of hardware. They don't mention it, but this is the entrenching tool. This weighs a lot. It's very heavy, but it, it too is worth every ounce because it is a shovel. And if you are pinned down in mortar fire or any kind of machine gun fire or whatever, you use this while you're pinned down to dig a hole that you crawl into. So it quite literally is a life-saving device. It is like carrying a life preserver on the ocean. We were also taught to fight with these as a last resort. It, when it was new, very sharp along the edges here, it's the perfect size. You do not want to be hit with this thing or stabbed with it. So that he, I'm surprised he does not mention the entrenching tool. At least maybe I missed it, but, but this is compulsory. The other thing that's compulsory is a flashlight. And I don't, mine is, I, I did save my flashlight, but I don't have it right here with me. It's in the attic and I hurt my calf, so I'm not getting up in that damn attic. <laughs> okay, so anyway. The, but the, I, want to, I want to impress upon you how important that poncho liner is, the Wooby. It is the, the piece of equipment. Everyone carries it. It's your, it's your blanket and everything, anything else you need it to be. Okay. I mean, we threw the poncho away. <laughs> the poncho, we threw it away. We had Gore-Tex jackets for that, but the poncho liner, that's the real... And you can buy them on eBay if you're interested. <laughs> or you can buy them on Amazon. Just get one on Amazon. Easy, easy peasy. Okay. In April, for instance, Ted, Ted Lavender was shot. They used his poncho to wrap him up. It's a shroud and also a stretcher. Then to carry him across the paddy, then to lift him into the chopper that took him away. Straight up. It is a stretcher. And that's what it's used for. It is almost indestructible. They were called legs or grunts. I've never heard anybody call soldiers legs, but whatever. To carry something was to hump it, as when Lieutenant Cross humped his love for Martha up the hills and through the swamps. In its intransitive form, to hump meant to walk or to march but it implied burdens far beyond the intransitive. Almost everyone humped photographs. I mean, you guys, I don't wanna to be too uh, incendiary, but when you're dealing with military stuff, everything is pornographic. So when they say hump 
part of the Prick 113, well, you can just let your mind go wild and, and you'll be right. Okay, almost everyone humped photographs. In his wallet, Lieutenant Cross carried two photographs of Martha. The first was a Kodachrome snapshot. Signed love, though he knew better. Okay, I'm gonna miss, I'm gonna skip, skip forward. It's talking about uh, Martha, 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 Martha. What they carried was partially a function of their field specialty. Like for me, you know what I would have carried. Although we had, I didn't have to carry it in a, anyway, radio. Which makes you very important, by the way. <laughs> As a first lieutenant and platoon leader, Jimmy Cross carried a compass, maps, code books, binoculars, and a 45 caliber pistol that weighed 2.9 pounds fully loaded. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility of the lives of his men. So notice that some things that you carry are emotional and other things that you carry are physical, right? And then later on after the war, you carry all bunch of crap away that you wish you could set down. As an RTO, Mitchell Sanders carried the Prick 25 radio, a killer, 26 pounds with its battery. I have actually maintained some of these Prick 125. Uh, this is a Prick 25. The one that I know is a Prick 125. It is Vietnam War era. I don't know if he miss. I don't know if he miss screwed it up there or whatever. But it is not the PRC, Personal Radio Communications. Not that. It's Prick. The Prick 125, it is a killer. It has tubes, it has vacuum tubes in it and, and uh, couplers, mechanical couplers. This is before solid state. I mean, it weighs a lot and it is hard to maintain. You can drop it and it'll go out of tune. As a medic, Rat Kylie carried a canvas satchel, a canvas satchel filled with morphine and plasma and malaria tablets and surgical tape and comic books and all the things a medic must carry, including M&Ms for especially bad wounds and a total for a total weight of nearly 20 pounds. Now look at the note for M&Ms. Candy probably used as a placebo for men injured so badly they could not be treated. You would tell them here, this is going to help you. And I mean, they're in shock anyway, right? Carried the morphine. You've all seen Saving Private Ryan giving the last dose of morphine, these things. As a big man, and therefore a machine gunner, Henry Dobbins carried the M60, which weighed 23 pounds unloaded. You saw me with a picture of one of those. But which was almost always loaded. In addition, Dobbins carried between 10 and 15 pounds of ammunition draped in belts across his chest and soldiers' shoulders. As PFCs, or Spec 4s, most of them were common grunts, and they carried the standard M16 gas-operated assault rifle. This is what we call today the AR-15. Same thing, same thing. M16 is just the military version of it. It's, uh, well, at least the ones that I... Uh, operated with were not as um, updated with the accessory rails and all that kind of stuff. What you saw me firing a minute ago, that was the M203 grenade launcher on the bottom of an M16. And you have to tilt it way up and, and put the corner of it into your, into the, in your shoulder right there. And the, the sights flip way up like that. And you have to know the distance between you and the target, and then you have to lob it over like that. It's, it's great fun, it's great fun. But not if you have to shoot it at another human being. The weapon weighed 7.5 pounds unloaded, 8.2 pounds with its full 20 round magazines. Now we have 30 round magazines now, I don't know why. Depending on numerous factors, such as topography, psychology, of the rifleman carried anywhere between 12 to 20 magazines. That is a killer, Those, all, the, all the ammo that you carry, usually in cloth bandoliers. Now, they used to do it. Uh, you saw pictures of me in my web gear. It's, a, it's like suspenders. That's where you would have your grenades and, and, and all your um, 
like your 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 flashlight or whatever you you could have anything you wanted there, and then you have your web belt, and that's where you'd have your canteen. This is the old way of doing it, and you'd have you'd have a uh, cloth pouches around the bottom. In fact, I have a bunch of that stuff I think still, but uh, you'd have your cloth pouches around the bottom here, and that's where you, you keep your ammo. These days they do it a lot differently. They have their flak jackets, and they they'll carry the all bunch of stuff all in the like it's like breast pockets but they're all and they, they would carry their ammo right there now these days it's very different now but um same concept now that flak jacket let me tell you about that that thing saved your life but it is hot and it is a pain and i remember there's some airmen some airmen in at my play in my uh, duty station they thought it'd be cool to try to stab each other with you know well it doesn't it doesn't do anything against knives and so it just goes right through there and kills the guy. Dumbasses. Same thing with ma gas masks. I uh, want an airman at my at my base tried to clean, do some cleaning with some kind of heavy chemicals in the gas mask. No, nah. because that's that's uh, fumes. Fumes is different. I mean, if there's no air, you can't breathe, right? Okay, so. M16 maintenance gear, but Ted, La but Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried 34 rounds when he was shot and killed outside Tanni. And he went down under an, under an exceptional burden. Notice all the, the multiple layers of, of meaning in this language. He went down under an exceptional burden but it's also the things they carried, so it's his emotional burden, and he's scared. And we can forgive him for being scared. It's a scary thing. Anyone who comes to you and says they're not scared, they're probably the most scared of all. It's true. Although I had a great time, it was scary. The, before I went to Kuwait, the rotation before me, what a baby. Thank you, Hannah. I was a baby, I totally was. Um, the rotation before me, 18, it was the Kobar Towers bombing. 18 of the airmen that went died. Building blew, uh, you know, a terrorist blew up the building where, where they were staying. So it would have been me just if I had been the rotation before that. That heightened our awareness throughout our whole, uh, it was almost a year long deployment there. And, uh, and it was uh, the idea of any minute you can blow up, that works on you, it works on you. I came so close to dying so many times, I can't even tell you. One time it was a water truck pulled out in front of us. Um, another time was in Colombia, we were attacked. Um, and one of the worst things that happened was my buddy player got burned up. He was a firefighter in Colombia and he burned himself up. Anyway, um, we have the flak jacket. Now, this whole business about the dope, I've heard a lot about that in the, in the uh, Vietnam. I assume it's true because there's a lot of it in a lot of the different literature and movies and things like that. But I can tell you from my perspective in the Air Force, you, there's only a few things you can't do and drugs is one. You just can't do it. You just, just, you just, can't, you just don't. You don't do it. You can't sleep with other people's wives. You can't drive drunk. You can't let your bills get out of control and you can't do drugs. If you can just not do those four things, there's nothing that is ever going to happen to you in the air force. It's, it's outrageous. It is the most protective society on the planet. Ted Lavender went down under an exceptional burden. He was scared. More than 20 pounds of ammunition, plus a flak jacket and helmet and rations and water and toilet paper and tranquilizers and all the rest, plus the unweighted fear. He was dead weight. Wow. Look at that language, the double entendres that he's using. He was dead weight. There was no twitching or flopping. Kiowa, who saw it happen, said it was like watching a rock fall or a big sandbag or something, just boom, then down. Not like the movies where the dead guy rolls around and does fancy spins and goes ass over tea kettle. Not like that. Kiowa said the poor bastard just flat fuck fell boom down nothing else 
It was a bright morning in mid-April. Lieutenant Cross felt the pain. He blamed himself. They stripped off Lavender's canteens and ammo and all the heavy things. And Rat Kylie said the obvious. The guy's dead. And Mitchell Sanders used his radio to report one US KIA and to request a chopper. Then they wrapped Lavender in his poncho, surely his poncho liner. And they carried him out to a dry paddy, established security, and sat smoking the dead man's dope until the chopper came. So what do you do? I mean, what do you do? What can you do? Probably you're going to joke about it. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're not going to sit around there and cry. You cry later. But you're not going to sit around there and like hold hands and sing Kumbaya. What are you going to do? Let's smoke his dope. It's not that they didn't love the man. They did. But there's nothing you can do for him after that. He's gone. But the officer, the officer was in charge. Now, in the military, you need to understand, and it's a foreign concept, you guys. It's a foreign, 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 foreign concept to most of us in the civilian world. And it is this. When you're in charge of any, any group of soldiers, I don't care if it's one soldier or 50 or 100, anything they do wrong is your fault. It doesn't make any difference if you were in another hemisphere. It doesn't make any difference. If they screwed it up, it's your fault. By extension, if anything bad happens to them, it's because you did something wrong. They, I was in ROTC. They, they drill this into your head. Just drill this into your head. You know, you, this, is you, this is, they call it your charge, your command. And it's your fault. So poor Ted Lavender goes down. Let's think about his name, Lavender. You can do word associate. What do you think of with Lavender? That's well, nice and quiet and peaceful and tranquilizers, tranquil, tranquilizers. Oh. He was taking tranquilizers to try to stave off the anxiety of being killed. It is my, it has been my experience anyway, that the more scared you are, the more likely you are to die. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know why. The people who are hell-bent crazy, they seem not to ever die. Okay. In addition to the three standard weapons, the M60, M16, and M79. The M79 is the grenade launcher that you saw me firing a minute ago. We call it the M203, but whatever. They carried whatever presented itself or whatever seemed appropriate as a, me as a means of killing or staying alive. They're, they carried catch as catch can. At various times, in various situations, they carried the M14, a CAR-15, and Swedish Ks, and grease guns, and captured AK-47s, and chai chomps, and RPGs, and, Sig and Simonoff carbines, black market Uzis, 38 caliber Smith & Wesson handguns, 66 millimeter LAW and shotguns. Silencers and blackjacks and bayonets and C4 plastic explosives. Lee Strunk carried a slingshot, <laughs> a weapon of last resort, he called it. Mitchell Sanders carried brass knuckles. Kiowa carried his grandfather's feathered hatchet. Okay, so I want to key in on this other writing technique he's using, and it's very, very much like Kurt Vonnegut uses in Slaughterhouse Five, and it goes like this How do you? explain the unexplainable. I don't know if you've ever been in a car accident, if you've ever been in a um, any kind of thing. I was in a car accident when I was 18. I damn near died very close. Um, but it, 
there's a moment of slow motion, right? There's a moment when things aren't real and really honestly, um, you wouldn't feel it. If I had died in that car accident, it would just been just exactly the same as it would have been otherwise because I was just unconscious, right? Um, how do you describe that moment of like swimming in hyper reality? It's almost slow motion, but not quite slow motion. It is just, it's a, in a movie, it's like the montage of, you know, I don't know, there's no way to explain it. But at the, and thank God for shock. Your body goes into shock. You just will, and you won't feel anything at that particular moment. You'll feel it later. But, um, but how do you describe these things that are indescribable? Like when, like when uh, we were attacked in Colombia or, or, you know, like when multiple different things, right? How do you describe it? You ever seen a, a, you see a person on fire? You're like, is that happening? Wait, that, uh, wait, uh. there's this moment, right? I remember when I was a little guy, little boy, I stapled my finger, it went straight through. I mean, straight through the bone. <laughs> I do things well. So, so I, I looked up at my mom, I said, mom, there's something wrong with my finger. <laughs> I was in shock. How do you describe that moment of slow, of shock, of hyper reality, except for the way you experience it in the way you remember it, which is in fragments, in vignettes, in little bursts here and there, in retellings. That's what we're doing here. He's retelling the same story, much like Fahrenheit for, uh, Slaughterhouse Five, which is the death of poor Edgar Derby, who was put to death, he was put on trial and put to death in the ru ruins of Dresden, Germany after the firebombing for stealing a teapot. The most absurd you think you can think of. In that novel, this is a recurring image that happens over and over and over and over again. And that's how you remember it. You remember it first with a little bit of detail and then with more detail and then you pick out more details and then as it ruminates in your mind. And that's what he does here. I think that's the way to tell a war story. And it's the way that you remember it. You remember it a little bit here and then a little bit here, and then you put those two together and it's in the retelling over and over again. It's in that regurgitation, that rumination that it, that the, the horror of it comes. It's that moment you relive over and over and over and over again. And that is in a big way, PTSD, right? And so what we see in a lot of these war narratives is the mind of a PTSD type of person. It's these ruminations, flashbacks. So here's an example. Kiowa carried his grandfather's feathered hatchet. So he keeps coming back to that feathered hatchet. Every third or fourth man carried a Claymore anti-personnel mine, 3.5 pounds with its firing device. They all carried fragmentation grenades, 14 ounces each, they all carried at least one M18 colored smoke grenade, 24 ounces. Some carried CS or tear gas grenades. Some carried white phosphorus grenades. They carried all they could bear and then some, including a silent awe for the terrible power of the things they carried. Wow. Wow. And it's just such the, the I think the triumph of the, of the piece is that you have this double entendre of what you carry physically and what you carry emotionally. They all carried all they could bear. And then some, including a silent awe for the terrible power of the things they carried. It is true. Um, I, you know, I would, seen the war machine up close. I've seen it in, in detail. And I wouldn't say I've ever been in like any house to house fighting like some of the Iraqi war veterans would have been and things like that. But I've seen enough. I've seen the war machine and you walk away from it with a, a sense of awe. Oh my God, I was at so many live fire demonstrations in the Air Force. 
those, the F-15, the A-10 Warthog, the F-16, YF-22, these, these are the most powerful machines I can imagine. You see them light a field on fire. The guns, they all have machine guns. The guns sound, you know, okay, here's a, here's a pistol. You know, here's the M16. No. Here's the M60. Here is an aircraft gun. It, it sounds like no kind of gun you ever imagined. It's just a bzzz, bzzz, because it fires 300 rounds a second. And you see it fire if they're firing it to, toward the ground or, or at a target on the ground. You hear, you hear the bzzz, and then it's a moment, and then the ground explodes. <laughs> it's not like any machine gun you've ever heard of in your life. Bzzz. And you hear that sound and you know, like it's freaking the most terrifying thing ever. It's like, it's like hell from the sky. Zzz, zzz. Yeah. And then the sound the rockets make, like that. So you have these sounds and all these things, you carry that stuff with you. And when you walk away from something like that, you really bring with you a, an incredibly healthy and mature sense of awe. It is really just a sense of awe for the incredible power of it all. The power of it all is mind boggling, mind numbing. You guys, we have in the Air Force, there's no more dog fights. You know why? Because in the Air Force, we can identify targets over the horizon and shoot missiles at them and kill them before they can even see us or come into contact with us. We're, it's that, I mean, we got that kind of, we, we have insane stuff. The YF-22 can engage many multiple targets at once. I mean, this, our technology is, is, is outrageously spectacular. I can just tell you about the radio technology we have. It's probably even better now. But when I was in the Air Force, uh, the enemy could jam 90% of the entire spectrum and we could still communicate through something called half quick. It's frequency hopping. <laughs> So you might hear a little bit, but they can't jam our communications. I mean, we, <laughs> we've got our stuff going on. And that is, I think, I think of that when I say they care, they all carried all they could bear. And then some, and then some, including a silent awe for the terrible power of the things they carried. Yep. There is a beautiful portion here where Lieutenant Cross is talking about a pebble that, that he was given by Martha and she picked it up where the, where the land meets the water. That's the place where we're together, but also separate. Great symbolism there. He carried that pebble that she got for him. Ted Lavender carried the starlight scope, which are just night, night vision goggles. They all. Stand by a second. This is the part that freaks me out the most because I would be the one chosen for this probably. Dave Jensen carried earplugs, most often before blowing the tunnels. They were ordered by high, higher command to search them, which was considered bad news. So you've seen this in Vietnam movies where the, they, you would find a tunnel and you'd have to go into the tunnel. But by and large, they just shrugged and carried out orders. You have to, you just have to, because he was a big man. Henry Dobbins was excused from tunnel duty. The others would draw numbers. Before Lavender died, there were 17 men in the platoon. And whoever drew the number 17 would strip off his gear and crawl in headfirst with a flashlight and Lieutenant Cross's 45 caliber pistol. 
The rest of them would fan out as security. They would sit down and kneel, not facing the hole, listening to the ground beneath them, imagining cobwebs and ghosts, whatever was down there, the tunnel's walls squeezing in, how the flashlight seemed impossibly heavy in the hand, and how it was tunnel vision in the very strictest sense. Another, another multiple layers of meaning with that tunnel vision. You're literally in a tunnel with your vision, but also tunnel vision to get the hell out of there. Get, do, do your duty and get out. That swallowed up feeling and how you found yourself worrying about odd things. Will your flashlight go dead? Do rats carry rabies? If you screamed, how far would the sound carry? Would your buddies hear it? Would they have the courage to drag you out? In some respects, though not many, the waiting was the worst, worse than the tunnel itself. Imagination was a killer. On April 16th, when Lee Strunk drew the number 17, he laughed and muttered something and went down quickly. The morning was hot and very still. Not good, Kiowa said. But he looked at the tunnel opening and then out across the dry paddy towards the village of Tan Ni. Nothing moved. No clouds or birds or people. As they waited, the men smoked and drank Kool-Aid, not talking much feeling sympathy for Lee Strunk, but also feeling the luck of the draw. You win some, you lose some, said Mitchell Standers. And sometimes you settle for a rain check. It was a tired line and no one laughed. Henry Dobbins ate a tropical chocolate bar. Henry Ted Lavender popped a tranquilizer and went off to pee. A few, moment, a few moments later, and then this is the moment when um, Te, uh, Jimmy Cross is looking down into the hole and Martha comes into his mind. He's not attending to the details of the mission before him. He's thinking about her. That enormous weight of the unrequited love is pressing upon him, and he's not really carrying out his strict duty to keep a, keep a uh, secure perimeter. A few moments later, Lee Strunk crawled out of the tunnel. He came up grinning, filthy, but alive. Lieutenant Cross nodded and closed his eyes while the others clapped, strunk on the back, and made jokes about rising from the dead. <laughs> Worms, Rat Riley said. Right out of the grave, fucking zombie. The men laughed. They all felt great relief. Spook City, said Mitchell Sanders. Lee Strunk made a funny ghost sound, a kind of moaning, yet very happy. And right then, when Strunk made that high, happy moaning sound, woo, right then, Ted Lavender was shot in the head on his way back from peeing. He lay with his mouth open. His teeth were broken. There was a swollen black bruise under his left eye. The cheekbone was gone. Oh, shit, Rat Riley said. The guy's dead. The guy's dead, he kept saying, which seemed profound. The guy's dead. I mean, really. So I know that you all know about the, the stages of grief when you're dying. The first one is disbelief, right? Nah, 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 nah. Player got burned up. Nah, no, nah, that's not true but it is. You see something happen right in front of you, that is your first response as well. Nah, mm -mm, he's not dead. He's up. Hey, get up, get up. There is a moment always during any catastrophic event, during any shock like that, there's a moment of hyper reality. Like I said, that's where we are right here. The guy's dead. The guy's dead, he kept saying. The guy's dead. He's kind of freaking out. That's his moment of dis... He's, he's saying, he's trying to make himself believe that this actually just happened. Um, so 
they go on and they say they they make jokes out of it, of course, because what else can you do? I mean, what else can you do? You're not going to sit down and have a prayer vigil or something like that. You're just not going to do it. They said zapped while zipping because he was peeing to come back. Things like that. That's exactly what we would do. You would have to. You'd have to make light of it. And you'd have to make euphemisms. Buzzed while blazing, something like that. You know, right? So you'd have to. But I think that is something that I have learned in my time is that things happen quickly. Bam. And hype in a hyper real sense, like they said, bam, he's shot and he falls dead. So right there, it's this great theme of many, many, many war narratives, and it is the absurdity of the thing. It is the nonsensical manner in which people die in wars. Think about it. Poor Ted Lavender. Just coming back from peeing. That's it. He wasn't, it's not Rambo where he's hanging from a cliff with an M16 and firing an arrow with his feet and, and you know, spitting at the same time and killing people with his glare, shooting light, lightning bolts from his ass. <laughs> not that. There's no hero, heroism in it. There's no Rambo. There's nothing magical about it. You're coming back from peeing and somebody shoots you in the head and you fall dead like a sack of potatoes. And that's it. There's no glory. It's just absurdity. Just, just damn bad luck. If you're standing at the wrong place at the wrong time, you're going to die. All right. They carried USO stationery and pencils and pins. They carried sterno, safety pins, trip flares, signal flares, spools of wire, razor blades, chewing tobacco, liberated joss sticks. I don't know what that is. And statuettes of the smiling Buddha, candles, grease pencils, and the stars and stripes. Fingernail clippers, psyops leaflets, bush hats, bolos, and much more. Twice a week, when the resupp resupply choppers came in, they carried hot chow in green mermite cans and large canvas bags filled with ice, iced beer and soda pop. Water is the most important thing to carry and that's also the heaviest. But, um, but uh, yeah, so one guy, Mitchell Sanders, carried a set of starched tiger fatigues. I don't know why you would do that. <laughs> I don't know why you'd do that. Henry Dobbins carried black flag insecticide. So these, these very spe specific things, they took turns carrying the Prick 77 scrambler radio, weighed 30 pounds. But these things, I know I've already said it, but these things are things that are specific to each soldier and they tell so much about the person. Because when you just have a limited amount of space and you have to literally carry you have to literally hump or literally carry these items through the jungle. Then it really, really, really matters what you decide to take. Well, if you decide to take black flag insecticide, that tells a lot about your character. If you decide to take two pairs of clean underwear, that tells a lot about your character. <laughs> if you decide to take premium dope and tranquilizers, well, yeah. Uh, in the beginning, it said, who, who uh, practiced, fi practiced field hygiene? <laughs> That's funny. We were generally dirty most of the time. I mean, you do take showers and whatnot, but you're just, you just can't help but get dirty. Um, now, there's a moral to this story. He says, I'm, I'm on page five, 957. Henry Dobbins asked what the moral was. Moral? You know. Moral, moral to the story. What's the theme is what he's asking. Sanders wrapped the thumb, Sanders wrapped the thumb of a dead Vietnamese in toilet paper and handed it across to Norman Broker. There was no blood. Smiling, he kicked the boy's head and watched the fleas scatter and said, it's like, it's like that with old TV show Paladin. Have gun, will travel. Henry Dobbins thought about it. Yeah, well, he finally said, I don't see no moral. And there it is, man. Fuck off. So there it is, man. There it is, man. There it is, man.
Okay. There it is, man, is, is also uh, similar to Slaughterhouse Five. In Slaughterhouse it's Five, it's so it goes. Here, they repeat this phrase. There it is, man. There it is. And what does that mean? But I believe that any writer who mentions it over and over and over again, is no, it's very important. And also, if you mention it in the same section where they're speaking of the moral of the story, the theme, Perhaps that's the theme. There it is, man. There it is. And what does that mean? What is the theme of there it is, man? It just means this is the way it is. This is what the way it happens. This is the way it goes. And in the Air Force, we used to say, suck it up and press on. Because you're always getting screwed in some kind of way. Suck it up and press on. There it is, man. There it is. So I remember in Lawrence of Arabia, it's Allah has written, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. There it is, man. So it goes. It's like I said a minute ago, if you're standing on the side, if you're standing on the wrong, at the wrong place at the wrong time, you step on a landmine, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, you're going to blow up. There it is, man. There it is. And so maybe it's the meaninglessness of it, of the whole thing. I thought, I've thought a lot about this and I hear many veterans down at the VA and stuff like that. And they say, there's this thing, why do we go to war? Well, civilians will say, well, we're fighting for the freedom. We're fighting for the freedom, American freedom. What? Soldiers will say, I'm fighting for my buddies. which I think is the stupidest reason to go to war ever, but still, it is the reason. You're there to protect your friends. You're there because the love that you feel between yourself and these, these people that you have trained with, lived with, is not uh, describable in words. I mean, you die for any of them. That's what you're there for, right? And you're there to protect them. You're also there to protect your reputation. You know, you don't wanna be seen as a coward. But you're also there for your country, for sure. I mean, you join, oh yeah, yeah, sure. But by and large, you're there because you, everything, all politics are local, they say. It's your circle. You're going to protect your buddies. And to me, that is a nonsensical reason to go to war. Why, why are we in the rack? Well, so I can protect my buddies. Well, let, let's bring your buddies home. There it is, man. There it is. So I think there it is, man. That's it. it. It's just the absurdity of the whole thing. It is written. This is the way it goes, right? Okay, guys, what do you, what do you think? I think it is, uh, we have a little bit of time left. I'd love to hear your voices. Um, we have the physical and emotional burdens of war. We've talked about that. The fear of shame and humiliation. We've talked about that. Um power of friendship. We talked about that. Pointlessness of war. I mean, very few wars are like very clearly purposed, right? I mean, Second World War is pretty clear, but it's rare. How about um, war stories? I want to tell you guys something. Just the other day, I taught you Hemingway. And I taught you something that I have read in many books on him. And in fact, I think it's in the Norton uh, anthology. It was that he carried a soldier, a badly wounded soldier to safety after he was wounded. Turns out that is a total lie fabricated by Hemingway himself. You know how he got him wounded? A, mo a mortar round blew up next to him and he Past, he went out. I mean, you don't carry anybody after that. He made it up. And so another, another, uh, another theme of this is the subjectivity of war stories. I have had so many, all my stories are, my stories are not really all that spectacular. I mean, it's not like I can tell you, I mean, I can't tell you all these real spectacular stories, but, but they're all true. <laughs> You'll find veterans who, just as you're retelling it, embellish it a little bit, 
and then embellish it a little bit more and embellish it a little bit more and embellish it a little bit more until finally it's not even true. It's just, it's not true at all. But the scary and sad thing about it is they probably remember it as true. And with PTSD, you don't, you don't even have to have been there. It could be your best friends there and you still replay that over and over and over in your mind, right? 